Good morning, WC. Would you please stand and worship with us this morning?
I'm so thankful that we have a God that is there all the time for us. No matter what we're going through, no matter what's happening. And this morning we want to take a special time out of the service as we do consistently. Why? Because prayer matters. Because God answers prayer. Because that is how we communicate with God. We tell Him, God, this is where I am. Even though He already knows, right? It's a step of faith. Saying, God, I trust. I trust you. So I'm going to ask the board and the staff if they're co- they would come forward. They're going to stand across the front. And as we continue to worship, if you have a need, would you just step out and find one of us? And we want to pray with you. The Bible says where two or three are gathered, there the presence of the Lord is. And we know that when we speak in faith together, God is able to answer our prayer. So would you join us this morning as we continue to worship and pray?
Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. Come on, Jesus. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. says here in Acts 4.12 And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which must be saved. Amen. Some of the last lines we sang in Good God Almighty, Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the noontime. The name of Jesus has power, amen? He shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints. My gaze transfixed. And I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' name.
hand clap of praise. Thank you, Lord. God, we're so grateful that we have the opportunity to come and worship in your presence. You are a great and mighty God. God, may we hear your voice this morning. Speak to our hearts. Speak to our minds. God, let us, let us know your word. Hear your truth. God, we honor you. We thank you. We give you praise. And now it's your opportunity. As you've loved on Jesus to love on a friend and love on a neighbor. So I would encourage you, would you find one or two people sitting around you? Maybe even somebody you don't know. I would encourage you, find somebody you don't know. Shake a hand, introduce yourself. Give them a high five, a fist bump, a hug. If you're online with us, give us a thumbs up, a heart emoji. Type your name, let us know you're there. We're so excited you're here this morning at the Walpog Church. It's good to be in the house, Lord. Melina, come on up. Every uh, once in a while, we have the opportunity to just thank uh, our staff and even our volunteer staff. Melina is in charge of our women's ministry, and her and Greg just celebrated their anniversary. How many years? 26 years. Greg's right there. So, happy anniversary. We appreciate all you you do for our church. Thank you very much. Hey, I like to embarrass them just every once in a while. Like, if you're a guest with us this morning and this is your first time here, in the car, in the chair in front of you, there's a card. It looks like this. It says communication card. If you could, would you fill that out uh, during the service and just put your name on it? And uh, we, we promise we're not going to spam you with mail, but we would like to say hello. We look, would like to reach out to you and introduce ourselves to you. And then if you would, just drop this in the offering bucket later in the service. As uh, you leave, if you'll catch me at the door and just let me know, hey, it's my first time here. I just have a box of wine and chocolates just to say thank you for being here. We're so, yeah, see, some people like wine and chocolates. Just to say thank you. We're so appreciative uh, that you're joining us this morning. Would you join me? Let's welcome all of our guests this morning. Come on. Is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. 
We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community, and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So welcome to church. Amen, amen. If you grab your notes and flip to the sermon notes, we take notes because we forget 80% of what we do not write down, and we believe it's important to remember God's word, amen? So grab your lipstick, Crayolas, mascara, whatever you need to take notes. Now we are beginning a series this morning on Daniel. Every year we try to do at least one character study where we look at people of the Bible and we look at their lives and, and their ups and downs, their, their victories, their failures, and we try to do this so we can maybe, maybe get a glimpse of, of maybe how we can live and lessons we can learn. We also do this in uh, at the same time as our kids. So as we're going through this, uh, we're going through Daniel chapter 1. Kids will go through Daniel chapter 1. Their lesson might be a little bit different than ours, but it, at least when you ask your kids or your grandkids, hey, what'd you learn? And they go, oh, no. You can say, I know exactly what you learned. Can we talk about Daniel? And so that's what we're going to be doing over the next several weeks. So would you join me? Let's look at Daniel as we talk about what's in a name. Any history people? You, got, you like history? Any history buffs? All right, all right. I'm going to give you just a little bit of history today. Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. So here's what we see. Realization number one, the book. Let's look at the book of Daniel, what we know. Some background information. It is one of five books of the Bible called the Major Prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. Those are the five major prophets. There are 12 minor prophets. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. And I think I've given all this in your notes so you don't have to worry about how can I remember all those names? I gave it to you, okay? Now, the prophet in the Old Testament functioned as the person that God spoke to and then the prophet gave God's words to the people. It was typically a word of warning or a word of encouragement. Turn around. Don't do that. If you do that, there'll be consequences. Continue praising God. Continue seeking God. And then occasionally there were prophetic words about what was foretelling about what was coming. Uh, a lot of them focused on the Messiah. Do you realize in the Old Testament there were 300, over 300 prophecies about Jesus first coming and there's 800 about his second coming how much more do you think we need to be ready for him to return so some historical information about the book daniel is both historic and prophetic he is the one that writes the book it's written somewhere between 536 and 530 bc obviously that first verse tells us it's about 605 that um they're being besieged so it's written just a little bit after uh that happened just a little bit before this, the book was written. The first six chapters are events happening in Daniel's life. And primarily, that's what we're going to look at over the next few weeks. The next six chapters focus on prophecy in the future. And if you've joined us during our Wednesday night study in Revelation, we've looked at Daniel quite a bit, haven't we? So let me, um, the, the period of time that we're talking about here is what's known as the Babylonian exile or Babylonian captivity. So let me give you just a little brief snippet, if you will. And you want to know, well, what are we talking about? What's happening when? During this period of time, you have King Nebuchadnezzar who's reigning through most of the book. And then you can see Daniel, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. There's some overlap there. So if you've ever read the Bible and you read something in one place and you read like the exact same thing in another book, that should kind of clue you in that these are probably written about the same events and they're just maybe a different author is writing it. So this is not the first time that the Jewish people have been exiled or gone into captivity. Let me give you some national information. National information. After Solomon, David's son, Israel is split into two. They decide that they, don't, they want not only a, a different king, 
but they want to worship as they want to worship. And so Judah is in the south, and Israel is in the north. That's how they split the two. Judah includes Benjamin, the tribe of Judah, and most of the tribe of Levi. All the other tribes of Israel make up the northern kingdom. The problem is this, is that Israel continues to worship other gods. Israel breaks its covenant with God and follows along with other nations and worships other gods. And so their continued sin causes God's judgment to come upon them. And he allows other nations to defeat them, trying to turn their hearts back against God. And they do pretty well, and they turn around, and then they turn back around. Then they turn around, they turn back around. You know, it's kind of, um, if you have not seen the movie The Forge that opened this weekend, uh, some of us went out and watched it. It is a fantastic movie. One of the lines was this, don't take one step forward and then one step back, baby. That's just doing the cha-cha. Okay? But that's how life sometimes works, doesn't it? We feel like we gained a little ground, then we lost a little ground. We did a little. So there has to be that. And that's what Israel is doing. They're just back and forth, back and forth. And so Assyria invades the northern kingdom in 722 BC. They are brutal in their treatment of Israel. Matter of fact, so brutal, if you read different passages of scriptures, it talks about how they will stomp out the babies of pregnant mothers. That's how brutal they are. They are horrible to the people of Israel. And in 605 B.C., they started taking people from the ten tribes back to Assyria. And they take them back to Assyria, and these people are never returned to their homeland. Matter of fact, they're commonly referred to in the Bible and in um, uh, uh, history as the lost tribes of Israel. Assyrian moves into the northern kingdom. They live with the Israelites. They marry them and attempt to assimilate them. They are trying to turn their life around, and their descendants... We've talked about before, they are called Samaritans. I mean, remember that name, we've heard that name before. And so here's a map of kind of what's happening here is you have uh, Assyria who invades in what would be Iraq or Saudi Arabia. They invade and they remove all the people back up to an area, maybe a a city uh, that you've heard before in Nineveh. Anybody heard that city before? And so they would move people into this area and exile them there. And then you have, um, let me give you another map I think I have. So the the top arrows there, that is the people that are exiled to Syria. And then the Babylonian Empire comes over, and they take out the southern kingdom, Judah. And they take people to Babylon. Now here's the thing is, they kind of work a little bit differently. Assyria would take people and remove them from their place and try to spread them out and make them assimilate into other areas. Babylon would take the best of them, bring them back to Babylon and try to train them. And then Babylonian people would go in and send governors and regents and people who would try to rule over the people and change their their ways from being a leader in that area. Does that make sense? So one way you're trying to spread people out, the other way you're trying to come in and then you tell people what to do. And this is what happens to the nation of Israel, both the northern and the southern kingdom. Why? Because they failed in worshiping God. They chose to to go different directions. Look at Daniel chapter 1. Let's continue. During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Israel and besieged it. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim. I want you to just notice who gave the victory. The Lord did. The Lord did because Israel did not do what was right in the sight of God. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in the treasure house of his God. And so here's realization number two, the victory. The victory is not won because Babylon is stronger. Because how many times, if you've you've read the Old Testament, you have seen Israel overtake stronger enemies, yes? Yes? You've seen that happen. The victory is won because, and this is something we've seen, because Israel is not obedient. If you want to jot this down, just as kind of a side note, sometimes the enemy is a, wins a victory in our life because we haven't been obedient. When you and I are not obedient, God allows the enemy to take ground. Why does he do that? Again, let's go back to what we have already learned, and we've talked about this on Wednesday night especially. God is after our heart. And if God can get our heart by causing us to go through suffering and pain, he'll do that. Now, at the same time, do we go through suffering and pain just because it's part of life? Yes. But God's after our heart. God wants us to turn to him. 
And so in 2 Kings 17 through 25, and Amos, Hosea, Micah, Habakkuk, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Ezra, Nehemiah, all of those books deal with this exile. They deal with this problem of Israel not turning to God and they're exiled because of it. Parts of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel all deal with it. The Babylons invade the southern kingdom in 586. Nebuchadnezzar levels the temple. This is the first destruction of Jerusalem. And he does it because Israel rebels and they refuse to submit to his leadership. And he says, oh, you're not going to listen to me? And he wipes out the city. The second uh, destruction of the temple would come in AD 70. We've talked about that, if you remember, just after Jesus is dead, is killed, is resurrected. And about 35 years later, the temple's destroyed again for the second time. It will be rebuilt. It will be re- re- rebuilt a third time before Jesus returns in the millennial reign where he will rule and reign for a thousand years. Again, we've talked about that on our Wednesday night study. Everyone would be exiled to Babylon for 70 years, but only the tribes of Benjamin and Judah would return to Israel. Why? Why would only some and not the others? Again, God is after people's heart. It seems like the southern tribe was a little bit more uh, obedient to God. But why did it all happen? Look at Jeremiah 25, 7. But you would not listen to me, says the Lord. You made me furious by worshiping idols you made with your own hands, bringing on yourselves the disasters you now suffer. Now the Lord of heaven's army says, because of you have not listened to me, I will gather together all the armies of the north under King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, whom I have appointed as my deputy. I will bring them all against this land and its people and against the surrounding nations. I will completely destroy. And that word destroy is consecrate or make an offering. In other words, I will make it so it honors me. And you and I will make this an object of horror and contempt and a ruin forever. I will take away your happy singing and laughter. The joyful voices of bridegrooms and brides will no longer be heard. By the way, for uh, Wednesday night crew, we kind of heard that before on Wednesday night, so that that should kind of take something away. If you haven't been there on Wednesday night, you've you've missed out. It's all on the website. You can go listen to all of them, but there. Um, uh, Verse uh, 10 and a half there. Your millstones will fall silent. The lights in your homes will go out. The entire land will be desolate wasteland. Israel and her neighboring lands will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. Then after the 70 years of captivity are over, I will punish the king of Babylon and his people for their sins, says the Lord. I will make the country of Babylonians a wasteland forever. I will bring upon them all the terrors I have promised in this book, all the penalties announced by Jeremiah against the nations. Many nations and great kings will enslave the Babylonians just as they enslaved my people. I will punish them in proportion to the suffering they caused my people. Now, that last part is very important. I will punish them in proportion because God gave Babylon a chance to have hope. Based on how you treat Israel is based on how I will treat you. You will be judged, but you'll be judged according to the measure that you level against my people. Daniel chapter 1 verse 3. Then the king ordered Aspenaz, the chief of his staff, to bring the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who've been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men, he said. Make sure they're well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men the language and literature of Babylon. The king assisted them, uh, assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. They were to be trained for three years, and they would enter the royal service. Again, the king wanted the best, and he was going to educate them and kind of assimilate them, and then the best of what another nation had would now be his best. Realization number three, the task. The task for Nebuchadnezzar is very simple. It's assimilation. I want to take what Israel has, I want the best of Israel, and I want to make that a part of my kingdom. I want that to be what I, what I is my legacy. I want that to lead our kingdom. 
And so his job, his goal, is to kind of strip Israel away from what it had and give it to Babylon. Daniel at this time is a teenager. He's probably, along with the three other men that were given, there was probably more than that, but we're given four names. They're probably about 14 years old, just for perspective's sake. They're about 14 years old, and they've been taken from their homeland. They've watched as friends, family members have suffered, probably died. Everything they've ever loved is gone. They are removed from family and friends. Matter of fact, the only people they probably know is each other. They're in a strange land, strange place, serving a new king that demands that they behave in a different way. Babylon was extremely polytheistic. It worshipped many gods. When the Assyrians exiled the Jewish people, when they spread them out, they, they were trying to change their culture. For Babylon, it was, we're going to put you in and assimilate you, and now you're going to take on all the different things that we have. You're going to do what we do. You're going to eat what we eat. Matter of fact, if you look at the latter portion of chapter 1, you see that Daniel and, and the king have a different difference of, hey, we're not going to eat that food. We're going to eat different food. And there's a little challenge there. Why? Because Daniel said, even at about 14, he knew I'm going to obey God no matter what anyone else says. King Nebuchadnezzar was trying to absorb the roots, was trying to remove what the Israelite people knew about themselves. Can I just kind of give you something to think about that we're going to talk in just a little bit? How much so has our culture tried to remove what we know? Try to take away what we know is truth to say there is no truth. Try to take away what we, our foundation of, of principles. And they've tried to say, well, it's, we're going to live this way. We're going to do this. And it's a fight, isn't it? Daniel has been removed from everything, and yet he holds on to what he knows is true. It's not only this assimilation that we see but it's also prophetic. We see prophecy. See, not only did God say to Babylon, listen, however you treat my people, I will pay you back. But we also see prophecy. Matter of fact, we see prophecy that Daniel gives about, about the, the future, the revelation, and, and the seven years of tribulation. We see that prophesied in Daniel. We also see maybe some prophecy about, about Jesus birth. Many scholars believe that the story of Jesus' birth, the wise men, when they come from the east, they're coming from Babylon. Because Daniel is referred to, and so are the people that he serves with, are referred to wise men several times throughout this, past, throughout this book. And it would have been, think about it, it would have been Daniel who lives 70 years in Babylon. He would have shared some of his insight that God has given. He would have shared the prophecy to these men. So when it comes time for Jesus to be born, guess who's looking for him? The wise men of Babylon. And that's who comes. Is that, poss is that true or not? We don't know. But there's very good indication that it's very possible. Look at Daniel chapter 1 verse 6. Daniel... Hananiah, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azra were the four young men chosen from all the tribe of Judah. So the chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belteshazzar. Hananiah was called Shadrach. Mishael was called Meshach. And Azariah was called Abednego. Now, you've probably heard Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego before, right? We'll talk about those guys in the coming weeks. But I want to talk about the name. Why was their name changed? 
Why is it so? They were trying to assimilate them and, and bring them into a new country. Why the name change? Because here's what you and I probably don't understand as much as it was in that time. The name had significant meaning during that time. There's a changed name. So we see a changed name. Names in the Bible spoke to the character of the individual. Names called out the blessing of God. It called out help from God. Names even prophesied the future of the individual in their name. In Genesis chapter 17, God changes Abram's name from a meaning of high father to Abraham, meaning the father of multitude. Sarai's name is is changed from meaning my princess to Sarah, which means mother of nations. Was there significance in those name changes? Yes, because God made a promise to Abraham and Sarah and said, listen, you're going to be the father of many nations through the world will bless because of you. And so the name was very significant. God changed a person's name. He gave them a new name. Usually it was to establish a new identity. You're not the person you were. Now you're a new person. Matter of fact, we kind of see that in the New Testament, right? Behold, you are a new creation. The moment we accept Christ in our life, our name changed. Maybe not your name that you have that people call you on a daily basis, but in the sight of God, you are now covered by the blood of Christ. And so their Hebrew name, let's look at their Hebrew name for just a minute. Daniel has his Hebrew name, and they, they are very special. These names praise God. These names elevate and speak to who God is. So Daniel means God is my, righteous, God is my judge, God is my vindicator. Now, I think that's very important because we will see through Daniel's life. As a matter of fact, let me give you just a foreshadowing if you you probably know this. But Daniel, because of his faith, is thrown into a den of lions. How many heard of Daniel and the lions then before? Okay. But guess who stands and judges and who vindicates him? God. So Daniel's name speaks even to the event that occurs that God would be the one who judges and God would be the one who saves him. Hananiah means Yahweh is gracious. Mishael means who is like God. Azariah means Yahweh is my help. And so they're given a foreign name. Why a foreign name? Again, there was an attempt from Babylon to change not just their surroundings and get them out. There's an attempt to change their very identity. Shadrach means this, I'll do whatever goddess Aku commands or companion of Aku. Meshach means this, there's no one like goddess Aku or who is like Aku. Now, that may not mean anything to you, but for them, it was significant. It was significant for them personally because here they are. They're trying to change our identity. They're trying to change what we believe. They're trying to change everything about us. The culture is trying to change who they are. We don't see anything like that in our culture today, do we? Here's what I want you to know in case you're uh, just, you, you like this kind of stuff. The God of a coup, who is also known as Sin, Nanar, or Nana, is a Babylonian moon god. Uh, they share, it's a shared god of the Sumerians, not Samaritans, Sumerians. The Sumerians established many city-states in Mesopotamia. Their culture thrived until about 1700 B.C. when Babylonia subdued them, took control of their region during the reign of Hammurabi. Anybody recognize the name Hammurabi? From history class, you should. Hammurabi is the Hammurabi Code. It's the longest, best organized, best preserved legal text from the ancient Near East. Again, why is that important? Because all these things speak to not only the history of the Bible, but that the Bible is accurate in all it says. The Sumerians are credited with creating the first forms of writing, cuneiform, which is made up of a series of wedge-shaped marks carved into clay with a stylus. The Epic of Gilgamesh, I don't know if you've ever heard about that. It's the Adventures of Gilgamesh, and it also gives an account of a great flood. 
Where else would we read that account? Again, they speak to what? The truth of Scripture. Aku is the God of the rise of the waters, the God, the God of the cattle herders, the God of fertility. The God of the cattle herders, and, and most notably, it comes, uh, she comes out of an area called Ur, Ur of the Chaldeans. Now, if you've read your Bible, Ur might speak some, some memories back in there because there was a certain person in the Bible called out of Ur. Does anybody remember who that was? Abraham. See, God is weaving this all together. He knows exactly what he's doing. He calls Abraham out of there, and yet this nation now is coming after his people. And then you get to Abednego. Abednego has a little bit different. It's Nabu's servant or the servant of Nebo. And so Nebu or Nabu is the Babylonian god of vegetation. It's associated with other gods, including Nishba from Samaria, Thoth of Egypt, Apollo in the Greek, or Mercury in Rome. It's the god of wisdom and writing and learning and prophecies. He's also associated with agriculture and harvest, some kind called the announcer, announcer which hints towards his prophetic knowledge of all things. He is the divine maintainer of knowledge and the records of the library of the gods. And so, again, Babylonian, they had, they had several, several gods. And each one had its own unique, this is the God of rain, and this is the God of thunderstorms, and this is the God of vegetation. And so when you call a name, we're going to name you based on this God. And that's what those men are given a new name. And then you get to Belteshazzar. It's meaning Bel protect his life. Keeper of the hidden treasure of Bel. Bel is another name that was used to describe Marduk or Merodech, the god of thunderstorms. And oftentimes, the Babylonian people and those people would simply call him Lord. Not, not capital L, lowercase l, because only one person gets the capital L. Matter of fact, if you read Jewish text, you will probably recognize the name that Israel called this god, Baal. And Daniel is renamed after the very God that the Babylonians would say rivals the God of Israel. Aku, Nabu, and Bel, these are names given to Hebrews by Nebuchadnezzar in an attempt to conform him and to make them worship like he wanted them to. Even Nebuchadnezzar has Nebu in his name, and it means protect my son or protect my boundary. Matter of fact, look at Isaiah chapter 46, verse 1. Bel and Nebo, the gods of Babylon, bow as they are lowered to the ground. They are being hauled away on ox carts. The poor beasts stagger under the weight. Both the idols and their owners are bowed down. The gods cannot protect the people. The people cannot protect the gods. They go off in captivity together. Listen to me, descendants of Jacob, all you, you remain in Israel. I have cared for you since you were born. Yes, I cared for you before you were born. I will be your God throughout your lifetime until your hair is white with age. I made you and I will care for you. I will carry you along and save you. To whom will you compare with me? Who is my equal? Some people pour out their silver and gold and hire a craftsman to make God from it. Then they bow down and worship it. They carry it around on their shoulders and they set it down. It stays there. It can't even move. And when someone prays to it, there is no answer. It can't rescue anyone from trouble. Don't, do not forget this. Keep in mind, remember this, you guilty ones. Remember the things I've done in the past, for I alone am God. I am God, there is none like me. Only I can tell you the future before it happens. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. I will call a swift bird of prey from the east, a leader from a distant land to come and do my bidding. I have said what I will do, and I will do it. 
Listen to me, you stubborn people who are so far from doing right. For I'm ready to set things right, not in the distant future, but right now. I am ready to save Jerusalem and show my glory to Israel. Pastor, that's nice. That's just, I mean, I'm glad, you know, you tell us all the history. That's fantastic. But what does that have to do with me? So let's look at a godly name. These boys are faithful witnesses to God and his character and his sovereignty. You read their story, they don't objectify, they don't demonize the Babylonians. You don't see them calling them names or protesting or saying whatever. Instead, they do what is right humbly and win people's hearts from the inside. While they live among their captors, they are witnesses for God. They don't allow their circumstances, their past, or their present to change what God says about them. How much more should we live? When the world tries to change who you are, when the world tries to change your identity, how much more should you hold on to what God says about you? So how do we respond to a way that is faithful to God when we're in a foreign land? When we're taken captive? When we're lost in the world? These boys are a reminder and a witness of what God will do. Today, people all around us are striving for significance. They look to be somebody. I want to be known. Isn't that what social media is all about? How many people like me? How many people read what I say? I want to feel important. The only power that one might say is to have who, this is who I am. Because we long for an identity. I want people to know me. Can I just tell you? Really, that's a heart's cry that only God can answer. Because once God knows you and you know that God knows you, nothing else matters. We identify with groups to find significance, to find meaning, to find hope. Isn't that what identity politics is all about? My identity is wrapped up in whatever group makes me feel special or makes me feel like I'm important. Clark Sheeby, I put this in your notes so you could have it. Clark Sheeby, he's the head of the Canadian branch of the Labre Fellowship in Victoria, British Columbia. He said this, they don't know what to do with consciousness and they don't know what to do with significance. Our longing for significance has been placed in our hearts by God. People have put in their hearts longing for God, so they put the treasury of other gods, other things that make me feel special, other things that makes me feel significant. If I go here, if I do this, then people will like me. But by doing so and identifying with all these other things, we lose the one identity that's most important. There's a scene in The Lion King. It's probably one of my favorite scenes. But Simba has ran away from from the pride and he thinks that he killed his father and all those things that happen. And he's trying to figure out what his purpose is in life. He's trying to figure out who he is. And he sees a vision of his dad. And his dad says, you've forgotten who I am. He said, no, I didn't. No, Dad, I I know who you are. And he says, no, you've forgotten who you are. And in doing so, you've forgotten who I am. Can I just encourage you? When you doubt your identity, when you doubt who you are, you're forgetting what God says about you and who he is. Because you were made in the image of God. We're called and we're chosen to bring people to Jesus. That is our identity. That's our purpose. And here's the thing. We end up 
we end up fighting it. We fight it just like Moses. Look at Exodus chapter 13, verse 13. But Moses protested. If I go to the people of Israel and I tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me, they'll ask you, what's his name? What should I tell them? If I go to the people, what are they going to say? God, I, I don't have what. What are they going to say? They're not going to believe me. God replies to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. See, I don't know if you caught what we read in the passage before, but it says that God knew you and he called you before you were born. Look at Isaiah 49.1. Listen to me. All you in a distant land, pay attention. You are far away. The Lord called me before my birth. From within the womb, he called my name. God knows who you are. He knows where you are. John 10.2. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. See, God knows your circumstances. He knows what you're going through. He knows your name. But so many times we allow the world to try and give us a different name. The world doesn't want you to speak your name, God's name that he has given you, the power of Christ that is over you. Instead, they want you to listen to a different voice. When we call on God, do you know that we can receive gifts? God has good gifts for his children. Romans 10, 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him unless they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? James chapter 5, verse 13, are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you've committed any sins, you'll be forgiven. Have you forgotten who you are? Have you forgotten what God says about you? Because you and I have an enemy, an enemy who is a liar, who comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. Listen, some of you, Emotionally, he has stolen your identity. He has killed your passion for him. He has destroyed your hope. Some of you, it's more physically true. Your lives and relationships have been destroyed. He has killed things you love, people you love. The enemy has lied to you. He has deceived you. All in an attempt for you to forget the name above all names that stands beside you. See, the enemy wants to rename you based on your past. He renames you that you're alone, you're forgotten, you're hopeless, you're helpless, you're powerless, you're guilty, you're unworthy, you're lost, you don't deserve it. And if we're not careful, we start to believe the lie. We start to believe the name the enemy speaks over us. Here's what you need to know. There are over 600 names that God speaks over you throughout the Bible. 
Let me give you just a few of them. He calls you his bride, a city not forsaken, the faithful witness, the glorious church, a good soldier, the green olive tree in the house of the God, a holy temple, a new creature, a treasure, a masterpiece, a remnant, a righteous, the vessel of honor, Abraham's children, blessed, chosen, disciple, beloved, friend. He calls you family. He calls you known. He calls you forgiven. He calls you worthy. Probably some of my favorite. He calls us son, daughter, children. He calls us heir. He calls us priests. And he calls us loved. Isaiah 48.1. Listen to me, O family of Jacob, you who are called by the what? Name of Israel. And born into the family of Judah, listen, you take oaths in the name of the Lord, and you call on the God of Israel. You don't keep your promises. Even though you call yourself the holy city and talk about depending on the God of Israel, whose name is the Lord of heaven's armies. Long ago, I told you what was going to happen. Then suddenly I took action. All my predictions came true. For I know how stubborn and obstinate you are. Your your necks are as unbending as iron. Your head are as hard as bronze. And that's why I told you what would happen. I told you beforehand what I'm going to do to you. Then you could never say my idols did it. My wooden image and metal God commanded it would happen. You have heard my predictions. You've seen them fulfilled. But you refuse to admit it. So now I would tell you new things, secrets you've not yet heard. These are brand new, not the things from the past, so you can't say we knew all the time. Yes, I will tell you the things that are entirely new, things you've never heard before, for I know so well what traitors you are. You've been rebels from birth. Yet for my own sake and the honor of my, who, what? Name. I will not hold back my anger and not wipe you out. I have refined you. But not as silver is refined. Rather, I've refined you in the furnace of suffering. I will rescue you for my sake. Yes, for my own sake. I will not let my reputation be tarnished. I will not share my glory with idols. Listen to me, O family of Jacob, Israel, my chosen one. I alone am God, the first and the last. I want you to notice that passage. He says this. Listen, I will not be second. You can't have other idols. You can't let other things allow to control you. I'm going to be the one you worship. And I'll prove to you it's me. And I'll rescue you if you want it. My name will not be tarnished. I will redeem my people. I will show my people love. I will allow my people to continue. And the enemy keeps trying to give us a new name. He keeps trying to say what we are and what we should be. The world around us tries to tell us, well, you need to be in this box, and you need to live this way, and you can't do this, and you can't do that, and you can't say that, and you can't live that way. Well, I tell the world, I don't care what you say because I care what God says. Ignore the lies. What is the thing, what is the name that the one who is above all names gives you and gives me? Have we allowed God's name to be replaced by something the world offers? Have we allowed God's name in our life to be replaced by our circumstances, our past? Have we allowed God's name to be replaced by something the world says about us? The world needs God's people to show them the way, the truth, and the life. Because there is no other name by which we are saved. And that's Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. I'm writing to God's church in Corinth, to you who've been called by God to be his own holy people. 
He made you holy by means of Jesus, of Christ Jesus, just as he did for all people everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Your name, my name, is to be an image bearer of Christ. That's what my name should be. My name is written. I hope your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And it is under the name of Jesus that I find my identity, my purpose, my calling. And there's no other name that I want to be known as. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes, let me look around. What's your name? Who do you identify with? When people see you and the people look at you, do they immediately recognize that you are an image bearer of Christ, that you are a disciple of Jesus? So we start here. We say, Pastor, I need to ask God to forgive me. I have sinned. I have made mistakes. The Bible says that when you and I recognize our sin, we recognize the mistakes we've made, and we call on the name of the Lord, we ask him to forgive us. He is faithful and just. He forgives. Say, Pastor, that's me. I want to pray for you this morning. You say it. Just put your hand up. Put it right back down. Yeah, yeah, okay. Anyone else? Okay. Okay. Heavenly Father, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the times that I have failed. I have sinned. I recognize that because of my sin, that death is my penalty. Not just death on earth, but an eternal death in hell. Separation from you. So I come to you today and ask you, would you forgive me? I want to have life. Life eternal with you. I am sorry. I recognize that I need you in my life. I need your hope. I need your help. Help me to be the person you've called me to be. Some of you this morning, you've struggled with your identity. Called yourself lonely, broken, hurt. Maybe you call yourself abused, unworthy, unloved. God wants you to know he has a different name for you. But I want to pray for you. If you say, Pastor, I, that's, that's how I felt. That's how I feel. I feel like my identity has been broken or shattered. And I've allowed the world around me, I've allowed the enemy to deceive me. If that's you this morning, I want to pray for you. Just lift your hand up. Put it right back down. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can we pray together? Heavenly Father, change Change what I know. Change what I, what I know your word says about me, what you say about me. God, I don't want the enemy any longer to deceive me. I don't want to be fooled by the world. I don't want to be convinced by anyone else. God, I know that I am a child of God. I am loved. I have hope. I have joy. And the world around me desperately needs to see who you are. Just like Daniel is in a foreign place, sometimes I feel like, God, I'm in a foreign land. The world around me, I don't recognize it anymore. But I recognize you. And I need you to lead me. I need you to be the one who guides me. I need the people I meet to see you in my life. 
I carry the image of Christ in my life, and I want people to know who Jesus is. So let my life shine. Let it shine so bright that people have to ask questions. Let me be so bold that, God, I don't have to worry about what other people think because you will convict them of the truth. I trust you. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Anybody said? Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask the ushers to come. We're going to take our Sunday morning tithe and offering. I want to encourage you to continue praying for um, our kids as they go to uh, the release time activities. I want to thank you for your generosity. Thank you for continuing to give and, and honor God with your tithe, with your offering. I want to share just a little something that you're going to see happening next, starting next week. Our, uh, our children in kids' church are learning about a new game that came out, uh, BGMC. How many of you remember BGMC? Okay. BGMC means Boys and Girls Missionary Challenge. It used to be Boys and Girls Missionary Crusade. They changed the challenge. BGMC is what our kids, when they give offering, it goes to, to BGMC. BGMC helps our missionaries have uh, materials so they can hand out to kids, so they can hand out to um, to the mission field, and so some of them, they buy water jugs, some of them buy for areas that don't have that, they build wells, they do all kinds of things, but BGMC is specifically funded by our kids in our churches, and for those of you, you might donate money to BGMC, but specifically, it's, it's helping our kids to understand missions. How I many it's important to help our kids understand missions? And so they decided, they said, you know what? There's something we want to do, and we want to help our kids understand missions even more. So they kind of came out with a trading card game. Trading card game is similar to, to some of those trading card games out there. I don't know if you've got kids, they, they play Pokemon, or they play one of those other games like that. Well, this is a game that is all about missions. It teaches kids about um, how missions works, with the locations that some of our missionaries are in. It teach them about what, what missionaries need on the field, how, what equipment, what resources they use. It talks about how they can earn money and give to missions. It talks about what, how, how partnerships work. And the game works a little bit like this. They play cards back and forth, but you play a location card. And whatever uh, person wins, then the students pray for that location. So just in a nutshell, the kids are learning about missions. They're learning about how missions work. They're learning about partnerships. They got to do some math because that's how you get points. So, like, it's a fun way to educate kids. I mean, well, that's important because that's it's hard enough to do math, right? And at the same time, it teaches them to pray. I think that's a pretty cool thing when you can get our kids excited about those things. So, what you're going to see is you're going to see some of those cards around. Uh, next week, our board members will have a little yellow lanyard. And if your kids say the memory verse for each week, then we'll give them a trading card. And so they can buy cards and they can do all kinds of stuff, but we want to invest in our kids because we think it's important that our kids learn the Bible, quote the Bible, know the word, God's word. Amen? So if you see those around, I just want to give you a heads up of what's coming. And uh, I'm going to pray, and then you're going to see a little video kind of talking about it, all right? Father, thank you once again that we are able to come to you and worship you and serve you. We pray for our offering. We pray that you would bless it, use it for your kingdom. God, you are the only person who can take paper and turn it into souls. So as we give our tithe, as we give to you, God, be honored. May your name be glorified. Change hearts and lives in our area, change hearts and lives in our state, in our country, and around the world. We love you and we thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Here's Grandpa Buddy. <laughs> Hello there, young friends. I'm Grandpa Buddy, and I've got something exciting to share. Introducing the BGMC trading card game. Each card is packed with fun and fascinating facts about the places and projects BGMC supports all around the world. 
places like El Salvador, Cambodia, Tanzania, and more. Not only do these cards look awesome, but they also teach you about the resources needed at each location, the actions you can do to help raise funds, and the partners we work with to spread the love of Jesus worldwide. So gather your friends, collect these cards, and join the mission to make a difference. Get ready to play, learn, and change the world. The game of generosity. Grandpa Barrel, let's go. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. For those of you who don't know, I am Chris Tabor, the youth director here. So good morning. I have a few announcements for you, and then I'll get you out of here. Sounds good? All right, all five of you. Okay, so coming up, we have our movie tonight at 6 p.m. Uh, we will be showing Disciples of Moonlight. Um, here's a question for you. What if the Bible was illegal? Be kind of crazy, right? Um, tickets will be available at the door. Come with that question in mind. Come expecting. I think it'll be a very great movie. Um, also coming up this Wednesday, Revelation series is continuing. Um, that will be at 7 p.m. And also for any more updates, uh, check your bulletins. We are having our youth bake sale here in the next two weeks. So if you would like to bake for that, dads, come on. That was like, uh, if you would like to bake for that, holler at me or my wife, Jenna. And we will look forward to the bake sale with you guys. Um, other than that, that is your announcements for today. You guys have a blessed week. You're released. Come on, put your hands together. Let's sing it together. Praise the name above all nations. 